The board held a closed meeting earlier today, certified compliance immediately upon re reconvening in public at the forum work session, which preceded today's regular meeting. Please rise as student representative Kimberly Boateng leads us in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic of the Stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Liberty and justice. Now for a moment of silence. As I mentioned, we had a closed meeting and a forum prior to this, so we will go on to item 3.04 because we've already certified the closed me meeting. So 3.04, a recognition of LGBTQ plus Pride Month resolution by Mr. Frisch. Mr. Frisch. Thank you, Chairman Corbett Sanders. Um, whereas the struggle for acceptance, simple human dignity, and equality under the law for LGBTQ people is evidenced by the dedicated advocates and allies who endeavor to create a more inclusive society, and whereas June marks the 50th anniversary of the first Pride Parade, which came one year after the Stonewall Uprising, six nights of riots sparked when LGBTQ plus people led by transgender women of color like Marsha P. Johnson, and Sylvia Rivera resisted police harassment and brutality during an early morning bar raid. The hysteric moment served as a catalyst for the LGBTQ rights movement in the United States and around the world. And whereas the decades since have been one of struggle and celebration for the LGBTQ plus community, despite increased support and acceptance, LGBTQ plus young people still face many challenges. Without accepting families, they are 140% more likely to experience homelessness and nearly five times more likely to attempt suicide. And whereas a study from GLSEN this year found that 87% of LGBTQ plus middle and high school students often hear negative remarks about transgender people in school. More than 70% of LGBTQ plus middle and high school students were verbally harassed in the past year because of their sexual orientation. 60% of Latinx LGBTQ plus middle school and high school students experienced bullying based on their gender identity. And nearly 60% of black LGBTQ plus middle and high school students experienced bullying based on their sexual orientation. And whereas the Fairfax County School Board recognizes the urgency of its uh, charge to foster a responsive, caring and inclusive culture where all feel valued, supported and hopeful, Fairfax County School Board Policy 1450 seeks to protect students, educators, and other staff from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. The Fairfax County School Board appreciates the many contributions made by LGBTQ plus students, educators, staff, and families to the vibrancy of the broader school community. Fairfax County has a richly diverse LGBTQ plus community that includes people from all walks of life, who should be able to live without fear of prejudice, discrimination, or violence. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board, on behalf of the students, educators, and families of Fairfax County Public Schools, does hereby proclaim June 2020 as LGBTQ plus Pride Month in Fairfax County Public Schools. And in the spirit of one Fairfax, that the Fairfax County School Board urges all to respect and honor our diverse community and to build a culture of inclusivity and equity, not only during LGBTQ plus Pride Month, but during the other 11 months of the year as well. I so move. And is there a second? Seconded by Ms. Cohen. Mr. Frisch, would you like to speak to your resolution? Yes, thank you. Um, for many years, the school board has recognized LGBTQ plus History Month in October. But to my knowledge, this is the first time we have recognized Pride Month. In these difficult times with social distancing and schools closed, uh, Pride Month celebrations canceled across the country, I think we could all use a little pride right now. In a few minutes, the school board will vote to confirm this recognition. 
It will be a powerful symbol of support. But symbols, while certainly meaningful, fail to adequately support thousands of LGBTQ plus students, some out, but many still in the closet struggling to make their way. What would it look like to move beyond symbols and act on the promise of one Fairfax and our non-discrimination policy that purports to protect LGBTQ plus students and staff? For starters, Fairfax County Public Schools would finally create and enforce comprehensive regulations formalizing protections for transgender and gender expansive students. We could create a culture where students know our schools have their backs because teachers and staff would not sit idly by when homophobic slurs are used and students are dead named. Our LGBTQ plus teachers and staff would have equitable access to the same employee benefits as all other employees, including those that enable family planning. I could go on. Look, I can understand complacency. Our schools are so much better than they were when I was a frightened, closeted high school student in the late 19... But being better is not enough. Students are still suffering. I have met with virtually every GSA club in the county. At school after school, I have heard heartbreaking stories from students who lack the support that they need, not only at home, but in our schools as well. Every day is an opportunity for this school board to do better. In many ways, Fairfax County Public Schools have led the state when it comes to supporting our LGBTQ plus students. I hope the school board's past work will inspire us to act boldly in the future to do even more. I hope we will demonstrate the urgency our LGBTQ plus students so desperately deserve. And I hope when we celebrate Pride Month next year, we will still be seen as a leader on these issues because we have finally adopted regulations that protect transgender and gender expansive students. In the months ahead, the 12 of us have an opportunity to do the right thing and show pride in action. For the sake of LGBTQ plus students, staff and families, I hope we will seize it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Ms. Cohen, would you like to speak to your second? I would, thank you. Uh, Harvey Milk once said, that all young people, regardless of sexual orientation or identity. Oops, sorry, I was pushing the button. Harvey Milk once said that, re that all young people, regardless of sexual orientation or identity, deserve a safe and supportive environment in which to reach their full potential. Here in FCPS, our own school board has not always been able to speak with one voice about our LGBTQIA students, but today, is not that day. Whether you are gay, bi, pan, genderqueer, non-binary, gender non-conforming, trans, or any shade of the rainbow, we are glad that you are here. You belong in FCPS. We want you to feel supported as we navigate your way through your life and through our doors. We know it is often terrifying to be able to express who you really are and we want you to know that we believe your school should be a safe space for you. We know that helping you feel safe starts with having a school board who values you. So if any school board members have ever made you feel othered or less than, I'm so sorry. I know how hurtful the words said during some past meetings have been to my own family. But today is a new day. And this month is an opportunity to remember how far you've come and to know that you deserve the same rights and privileges as everyone else and to be proud of who you are. We are so happy that you are you. And we are so grateful that you are part of our FCPS family. Happy Pride Month. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Ms. McLaughlin. Yes, thank you, uh, both Mr. Frisch uh, for those eloquent words in the resolution. As the extremely proud mother of an openly gay son, um, I can't possibly convey how much this means to me personally to know that our board is uh, honoring June Pride Month and doing so in a way that truly talks about celebrating each and every individual in our community. Um, as Mr. Frisch noted, uh, for those of us who grew up long ago, it was 
um, an entirely different environment for love is love and to be who you want it to be. And when my son came out to my husband and me um, as a junior in high school, our only fear was what type of abuse and mistreatment he would receive. Um, our son was blessed that going to Woodson High School, he was embraced for who he was and was actually named homecoming or a prom king his senior year. And I mention that only because what I want for every single child in Fairfax County, around our nation, around the world, is to be loved and embraced for who they are. And we are not always finding that our children have the experience that my son had in high school. Um, I do know my son experienced um, bigotry and mistreatment when he was in middle school and it was hard. I don't want every any child to experience that. And so for this board today, for June Pride Month, to celebrate and say to our community how much every child matters, how much we celebrate who each and every one of them are, um, is a powerful step. And as Mr. Frisch noted, um, the resolution is one thing, it's the actions we take to continue to create an, ex an accepting inclusive environment will be our test in the days ahead. So um, I wish my camera were working. I am remotely in another state right now. I wish you could see the smile on my face, the joy that I feel and the gratitude I have uh, for my, this board and for what it's meant to be a Fairfax County parent. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Thank you very much. And um, I, it's hard to follow such heartfelt sentiments from Ms. McLaughlin. And I, I really appreciate sentiments as well as Ms. Cohen and Mr. Frisch. Um, and I am so proud, no pun intended, to um, support this resolution. I am I'm so proud to, to be part of this board that is saying that we value and we see everybody for the beautiful, wonderful human beings they are. And that's all that should matter. And I'm so proud to be able to, to support my colleagues in this endeavor. I, I kind of get tears in my eyes about it. And I, I don't have a family member or personal connection. I just so strongly believe that every single person should feel welcomed, included, respected, and valued and seen as human beings because that is who we are and it doesn't matter anything else that's what matters first so i just wanted to say thank you to my colleagues for the resolution thank you for, for the heartfelt words i've heard before and i just want all of our lgbtq plus students and staff to know that i personally and i believe my colleagues also are committed to making sure that you are valued and respected as human beings that we love and we want in our schools and your diversity and who you are are so very welcomed. Um, and we are proud of you, we value you and love is love. Happy Pride Month, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Ms. Keys Gamara. I'm sorry, it's taken me so long. I just uh, want to join in saying happy Pride Month to everyone. I just from the bottom of my heart want all of our students to understand how incredibly proud we are of the diversity within our schools and how we want every child to feel valued and experience the caring culture that we intended. Um, it breaks my heart to hear stories of students, whether it is because of their sexual orientation or their race or any other reason. Children should not be harmed in school. Children should be built in school. And so I'm glad to be a part of this resolution and to support it because I want that message to be loud and clear. And I want to make sure that we remove every barrier making every student successful. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Darren Koufax. Dr. Anderson. 
Nope, that was Miss Kiskamar. Miss Darnack, oh, I apologize. <laughs> I'm... That's okay. Marinette Koufax, please. That's okay. I, I just wanted to say that I wholeheartedly support this resolution honoring, honoring our LGBTQ community. Um, we will always be here for you, making certain that we have the policies and procedures in place to ensure that you, we have a caring and inclusive culture. We want you to feel safe, supported, and respected. And um, we struggled with this. Um, a few years ago, um, the it, it was unfathomable to some of us who were on the board um, when we merely wanted to add gender identity to our non-discrimination policy. Um, it was extremely hard to watch um, those who did not believe love is love. And so I want to say to all of our students and faculty staff out there we want you to feel safe and supported we want you to know that we we respect your your ability to love whomever you want and 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 please understand that as we move forward in this process we will continue to listen to you to care for you and to make certain you have, we have the policies in place that make you continue to make you feel welcome inside our community, whether you're teaching or whether you're a student. So happy Pride Month and um, thank you, Carl, for bringing this forward. Dr. Anderson. Okay, now it's my turn. Um, thank you, Carl, for bringing this forward. Um, I just have a very, uh, some um, very few words to share. Uh, but as a former teacher and principal, my approach to students and to school has been embedded in, in two main tenets, um, which is one, provide all students with a sense of safety, with a safe environment, and two, educate them so that they all can fulfill their potential. Um, I, want for all of our, I want for all of our students what I want for my two children, which is acceptance, inclusion, support, being valued, the feeling that they matter, the feeling that they're able to contribute in a meaningful way, and the feeling of not being invisible. It is with this in my heart that I wholeheartedly support this resolution because that is a very basic thing that we can do for our students. And when we say all, we mean all. My theme for the past couple of weeks has been a call to action. And so I thank Mr. Frisch for bringing this to our attention, for us to take action to ensure that what we say we want for our, all of our students is exactly what is happening to, for all of our students. Um, so I wish you all a happy Pride Month. And again, I'm in great support of this resolution. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Ms. Pekarski. Thank you. I also wanted to wish our community a happy Pride Month. And um, I, I would like everybody to know my commitment is goes beyond just helping to create an accepting environment um, in, in Fairfax County for all our students and, and staff, but also in a, an environment where we appreciate and realize that it's not just acceptance, but it's a valuing of who our students and staff are that really makes us uh, better. And it makes our communities better because of who you are and I too, I, I am I'm not one for many words, as some of you know, and I, I like to see action. And I, will, I look forward to taking these sentiments and making them into policies and actionable um, items and expectations. So we, so we are a place where our kids never feel othered, our teachers never feel other, but rather valued for what they bring to our school community. So thank you, happy Pride Month. Thank you, Ms. Bukarski. Ms. Tolan. Yes, um, as someone with a, a family member that I love dearly um, and watched for many years with LGBTQ issues, I am proud to stand today with my colleagues to see that everyone is welcome in FCPS and happy Pride Month. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. Ms. Omej. 
Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate the comments made, um, Ms. Cohen in particular, to, to acknowledge and own uh, what has been, how this has been discussed in the past and, and the toxicity that's been brought to this. And I'm, I'm proud to um, you know, support uh, students and, and my commitment has always been that students should feel safe, should feel loved, should uh, live up to their potential in, in, in spaces that are cultivating of who they are um, and whether that's our staff, whether that is uh, our young people um, who are looking to, to understand their identity and are struggling to fit in, um, who may face mental health challenges as a result of uh, uh, how they're treated, um, to just make a very clear statement that Fairfax County Public Schools is a place where uh, we are committed to, to making sure that no matter who you are, um, no matter what identity you fit into, uh, that this is a place for you and, and that this is a place where you can grow and, and thrive. Um, and in thinking about pluralism, really, this is an opportunity for us to come together in, in, in uh, understanding that and upholding that. Um, and I take the first step and encourage others to begin educating ourselves, really, uh, in a pluralistic community, in a community that prides itself uh, in the diversity that we have, um, to learn about those around us and to learn about their struggles and their joys and what defines um, their their belonging and identity within our larger community. I think that's where we really come to accept and understand. Um, it's not enough to just say, you know, we're here a place for everyone, right? But to really uh, care enough to understand everyone's journey. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Omesh. Ms. Marin. Yes, well, I still have my flag from last year's Pride events that were held at Lake Ann. Um, in Reston when I was with SBPS Pride and I was definitely disappointed that I could not attend any events this year due to COVID, but I kept my flag right here on my desk for that year. And um, I am excited to do the work that is, we can see it's happening now, but we have so much more to do. But the bottom line is all our children and all our staff um, deserve to be included. We'll see. Thank you, Ms. Mayor and Ms. Boateng. Um, well, I'm going to be real. I don't have many words to follow the beautiful words that Mr. Frisch gave, but I just want to take the time to say happy Pride Month. Um, I do wish that we, like given the circumstances, of course, Pride Month was unable to be celebrated in the way that it's supposed to be in the way that it deserves to be. Um, but I want to express, like expressly say to also the students, because I have never experienced any type of like ridicule for my sexuality and for that I'm very blessed. And I want to just kind of like put out there that they'll, I pray that there's a day that all my friends, regardless of their sexuality, will be able to express who they love freely. And it's just amazing how far we've come. And of course, we have a long way to go. So I just want to say happy Pride Month to everybody. And yeah. Thank you, Ms. Guateng. Uh, Mr. Frisch and Ms. Cohen, thank you so much for bringing forth this resolution. I think it is so important, especially because uh, we are doing so much virtually this year. Um, I did want to just actually put a date to this. On June 28th, that is the um, Stonewall Uprising date. And I just want people to know that that is a historic date. Um, and that's why today's date of June 20th, we try to put these resolutions as close to the historic date as possible. And uh, so please remember June 28th um, and the importance and significance of that. I also want to talk a little bit about how we talk about um, embracing each of our children and identifying them by name and need and that we have a caring culture. We have an inclusive culture, um, but it's one that we also need to ensure that we have a respectful culture. And that's why your words in this resolution are so important, Mr. Frisch, because it's about that underlying respect that we need to teach every one of our students and our staff members that no matter who you are, who you love, or who you identify as, that you are welcomed, you are embraced as who you are, and you are respected. And that you, uh, your respect of um, your self-respect is so critical because it is 
critical for us to have a caring culture that embraces each and every child uh, for who they are. And so I am so pleased, Mr. Frisch, to be able to support this resolution and continue the work that the board is doing in this very important area. With that, I will call for the vote. All those who um, support the resolution put forth by Mr. Frisch and seconded by Ms. Cohen, recognizing Pride Month for June, please show your hands. We have Ms. Cohen, Ms. Marin, Mr. Frisch, Ms. Keys Gamara, Ms. Bikarski, Ms. Dernak Koufax, Ms. or Dr. Anderson, Ms. Tolan, Ms. Sizemore Heiser, Ms. Omage, Ms. McLaughlin, and Ms. Corbett Sanders. That is unanimous. The motion carries. I now call on Ms. Dernak Koufax for a resolution honoring student representative Kimberly Boite. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am honored to be res er, honored to be reading this resolution. Whereas Kimberly Watank, a member of the junior class at Lee High School, has served as the 49th student representative to the Fairfax County School Board for the 2019-20 school year. And whereas Kimberly has participated in the work of the school board, attended meetings and special functions, and contributed helpful observations, as well as the student perspective to discussions of issues before the board. And whereas, she has advocated for providing assistance to at-risk students, focused on school workload and the impact of student health and well-being, and advocated for punishment reform. And whereas Kimberly has been a member of the Technology Student Association, International Club, Marching Band, Jazz Band, and Winter Guard, Minority Student Achievement Committee and the NAACP, as well as being a member of the Math and Music and National Honor Societies, all while carrying a course load, including IB Spanish, IB English, IB History of America, IB Chemistry, AP Calculus, BC, IB Theory of Knowledge, IB Anthropology, and Econ and Personal Finance, and whereas she has served as an advocate for all students in Fairfax County during her tenure as school board representative and has provided capable leadership focusing on the importance of education and keeping students needs foremost in all of our deliberations. Now for, therefore be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board acknowledges the service of Kimberly Boateng during the 2019-20 school year, expresses its sincere appreciation for her contributions and extends its best wishes for a bright future with promise. I so move. And I will second that because I represent Ms. Boateng. Uh, she is my uh, constituent. So Ms. Uh, Darinette Kofax, would you like to speak to your resolution? I will, and I can see Kimberly, your face there now, and I wanna tell you what a pleasure it has been working with you this year. I recall our first meeting at that Starbucks across the street from your high school, and all the things we talked about, um, we discussed that you wanted to work on this year as our school board student rep. And I've watched you not just grow, but blossom in this role. I know your family, um, he, all of your teachers, and all of those in the broader community who have watched you in this role are so, so proud of you. And we know that so much you've accomplished this year. Um, often the uh, role of the student rep is held by a senior. So unfortunately, we have to say goodbye and we wish you well as you move on. But you have accomplished so much as a junior and you are will still be with us as an FCPS senior next year. So we look forward to continuing to hear from you, continuing to see all the great things we know you will continue to do. And um, I don't have to say goodbye goodbye yet. So I will, we will do that next year as you graduate. So just have a wonderful senior year. Thank you for all that you've done. And as I said, it's been a pleasure getting to know you and watching you grow in this role. Thank you, Ms. Dernak Koufax. Kimberly, what a pleasure. 
I think it must have been your favorite meet spot because I too met with you the first time at the Starbucks and then Miss Keys Gamara joined us. It was such a lovely meeting. Uh, and I was so inspired by your wisdom, your sense of humor and your passion. Since then, I've gotten to know you so much better and I am so proud to be able to say that Mount Vernon is proud of you. You are just an amazing young woman. You're an excellent advocate. You ask great questions and you are a fierce defender of what is right. That fierce defense of doing what is right is not only in um, how you engage in the policy work that you have been engaged in, but you're also a fierce defender of your sister. And at, for those of you who don't know, Kimberly actually has a twin and she's a charming twin, but that special bond between twins is something that nobody understands unless they too are a twin. And because of how um, different you and your sister are, I think that's made you that much more passionate about making sure that everybody's point of view is represented and that you're constantly looking for innovative solutions as uh, you identify challenges and problems in our um, school system, in our community. And it is just so exciting that you're gonna still be around. And it's even more exciting that you're going to get a diploma with a new name on it. So bravo, um, we are just so pleased uh, to have had you serving as a representative of the students on this board. And we know that you will continue to stay engaged and come back and um, challenge us. So thank you. And now I have, I know every single member of this board wants to speak and I am going to start with Ms. Keys Gamara. Thank you. Well, I want to start by thanking Kimberly for being with me last night in my student town hall. She was my co-moderator. I suspected in the beginning that I might get kicked out. So I said, if anything happens, Kimberly, take care of everything. And, and sure enough, it was, it was a, a predictable occurrence and uh, she kept us on track um, in that it was an example of your leadership, Kimberly, uh, that you were able to operate with such grace. We had a heckler and um, we were not moved away from our issues at all. And I think that that is a um, really a picture of who you are and who you have been on this board. You have challenged us on equity issues in particular and insisted that we delve deeper to understand the impact of our actions or our inaction. Uh, you have witnessed the best of times in some of our accomplishments, and such as changing the name finally, but also the worst of times where people have come and said hateful things, totally disregarding that we represent a school system of young people and that their hearts and minds and their tenderness and innocence needs to be respected. And so I was very proud of you as in some of those moments, you let us know, excuse me, I shouldn't be listening to that kind of foolishness. And you're exactly right. But as a school board, we are here to do our very best to protect our students. Uh, you sat stoically when you heard those comments and, but you never ever gave up and you provided us insight into, into the harm of delayed action into the harm of misspoken words, into the harm of perhaps not delving as deeply as we can. So I want you to know that I will continue to be thinking about you and the challenges, how you challenge me uh, as I make comments about any type of inappropriate behavior toward a child really gets me ready to go to the mat. And I'm so glad to have had the opportunity to get to know you. You have made us better. And for that, I want to say thank you. Ms. Amish. 
Kim, where do I even begin? Um, I am so proud of you. I uh, have had such a pleasure working with you. I guess what, it's been like months now. Um, you've met my family, I've met yours. I, I think this is, it's been a pleasure to see uh, in action, the voice uh, of a young person with courage, who is unapologetic uh, about you know what's right, about what you're seeing in the school, what you're seeing in our system. Um, and what we know to be areas that is, you know need improvement. Um, I think in your legacy, we've often joked about how uh, we shouldn't just try to be, uh, you know, uh, um, accommodating or, or conforming to certain norms of professionalism, right? But but going out of our way to really speak what's on our mind. And in in your legacy, I hope to uphold that to speak truth to power, as we often talk about. Um, it's been an absolute honor to see your commitment and your passion for making sure that we uh, get important information to the community. Obviously, it's it's been beyond enjoyable to have you co-host with me for I don't even know how many sessions now, um, talking to the community and, and, and educating them about what's going on on the school board and making it simple for them as much as possible. I know you spoke up when it came to the AAP, the advanced academics. I know that you had a commitment when you ran in with the SAC and you promised them about certain things with equity and you have made them proud um, with the name change, with the discipline conversations we've had. Um, it's just been an honor to see what students are capable of. You've proven that um, and, and have been a voice that, that really, if I'm going to be entirely frank, has been fearless in ways that maybe some of us or I'll speak for myself haven't even. Um, so I did want to make this special for you. Um, our corn stream team, one of our, one of our student teams, did come up with a number of quotes about you and how exceptional you are. Um, I will share those with you, but just a tidbit, I know for the sake of time, you know, hardworking advocate for students across FCPS from all backgrounds. I love her energy, enthusiasm, her aura. I hope we can get more memories. Kimberly is not only an exceptional person in how she fights for all students, she's also a great friend, knows exactly how to advocate for students, stands up for people, the student body, provides a voice for the voiceless. I can go on, um, but really, uh, you know, students look up to you. You've, you've done us proud, and uh, I can't wait to support you in the next in your journey ahead. So I'm really proud of you, Kim. Mr. Frisch. Thank you. Um, so Kimberly and I sat next to each other for the first two months I was on the board before the closure, um, and while I certainly enjoyed sitting next to you, Kimberly. Um, I've enjoyed even more watching your leadership during the school closure um, as you stepped up uh, as the conscious of this board. And, you know, you recently said that you recently apologized for shaking the table when talking about your advocacy. You know, uh, I hope you never stop shaking the table, first of all, um, because it has power and it has impact. Um, and, you know, if, if I could will anything into existence, it would be uh, an Ikea full of t tables for you to shake. Um, because when you shake them, people listen. And uh, people should do a lot more listening to you. Thank you for all you've done. Dr. Anderson. Okay, I'm just getting my video on. Thank you. I, I was able to see Kimberly a little while ago, but she disappeared from the screen. And so I am disheartened that I'm not, oh, yes, there she is. Um, I'd love to see that smile. Um, I, I want to say in my short time working with you, Kimberly, you've done nothing but be impressive, impressive and eloquent, um, impressive in your advocacy, impressive in your fervor for justice. It has been just wonderful to see you as such a very young person, a junior, participate in the way that you have. Um, you fiercely committed to equity, and that work is um, commendable. Um, you have been phenomenal, unapologetic, and exemplary in everything that you've done. Um, you give me hope for our young people, because if you are the voice of our future, then I feel that we are in very, very good hands. I'm really looking forward to seeing how you continue to hold us accountable as a board moving forward, since you are going to be in our schools in the next year. And again, I go back to my theme of call to action. We are saying a lot of things that we want to do. You will be that student who is experiencing those things and how quickly we're getting to those things. And I know you will hold us accountable because you are you are fearless. I agree with what Ms. Omesh said. 
Um, one of the things that I wanted to do in my goodbye to you is to present you with something that I'm not able to do in this forum, but hopefully I get a chance to give it to you. I want to offer you a poem um, by Maya Angelou, Phenomenal Woman, because I believe that is you. And it is a wonderful poem that has always spoken to me since I was a high school student. And I've just, I've seen that in you since the very, very, very first day. I do want to take liberty, even though I know time is of the essence, not to read the entirety of the poem, but to one piece that I think really fits well here. And that part is as follows. Now you understand just why my head's not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. Those things speak so clearly to who you are. You walk softly, but you have carry a very, very big stick. And I am so proud of that stick, your voice, your fervor, your passion that you have brought to this board. You've pushed me to also be bolder in my stance because you are, you are in that place. And so I've appreciated that. So phenomenal woman, that is you. Congratulations. Ms. Pekarski. Thank you. I am no Maya Angelou, but I, I wanted to write down my thoughts so I don't, I don't forget anything that I wanted to say to you, Kimberly. First, I want to thank you for your service. You have an incredibly passionate voice. You use it loudly, without apology, always fearlessly to make FCPS, our community, and really our world a better place. And my hope for you going forward, um, I can't even believe you're a junior, um, but it's my hope that you never, ever lose that voice and, the, and that um, passion that you bring and the way you light up a room whenever you walk into it because of who you are. I cannot wait to see how high you will soar in your senior year and well beyond that. Um, I hope your family is proud of you. I think you, you have understood that this board is extremely proud of you, Kimberly. So thank you and good luck next year and keep in touch so we know all the great things you're doing. Ms. Cohen. Well, Kimberly, I am uh, so sorry that we only got to spend a short time with you. I, like Carl, had the distinct privilege of getting to be a seat away from you, and I felt really lucky with my placement on the board. Um, I'd like to believe at your, at your age that I carried myself with the grace, poise, and strength um, that you do, but I'm pretty darn sure that I didn't. You are a fierce lion, and you remind us constantly that our job is to push ourselves to support and protect our students. I'm so grateful for your service here. And I know without a doubt that you're gonna stick around um, and continue to be a force to be reckoned with and reminding us that we have an obligation to all of our students. So we expect to see your face. This is not a goodbye. And I really look forward to um, getting to thank you in person. Ms. McLaughlin. Yes, thank you. Uh, Kimberly, I'm sorry my video is not working um, because I would love to not only see your beautiful smile, but for you to see the smile on my face as I share with you how much I've enjoyed working um, with you uh, this past year. Uh, I absolutely want to echo all the beautiful things that my colleagues have said about your service on the board, but I want to focus particularly on your unique leadership because having a strong voice is not enough. It is being the type of leader that unites people. It brings people together. It creates that um, genuine connection in saying, let's have these crucial conversations. Let's see, have these hard, difficult conversations, but let's do it in a space that says, I, I want to welcome the dialogue and have people feel not only heard, um, but that you then bring them along in that um, shared um, belief and also uh, a shared mission to make our schools better for each and every child. And so I, I, I now um, 
beginning my ninth year on the board and wanted you to know that uh, I have a big smile on my face for the pride and the joy that we've all been able to share with your service this year. And as a fellow twin, uh, I do want you to know that uh, I consider it one of the greatest gifts to come into the world with my best friend. And I hope you and your twin sister continue to be that rock and source of support for each other for the remainder of your lives. Um, be well, Kimberly, and please know that we look forward to continuing to hear and enjoy and celebrate your successes within FCPS. Ms. Tolan. Yes, Kimberly, um, it's been just a joy to work with you. You are so conscientious, thoughtful, and unbelievably eloquent um, for someone you know, that's it, only a junior in high school. I shouldn't say only, but a junior in high school. I'm just, you are an incredible example for all of our FCPS students. Um, your communication skills are um, really amazing. And you are, are a critical thinker and really approach, you know, problems with a, you know, let's figure out a way to solve it for everyone um, kind of attitude. And that is incredible. Your resiliency under pressure has been very impressive to me as we've been dealing with huge issues on this school board, you know, COVID-19, Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, you've just stepped up and dealt with all of it with grace. And in many cases that people have mentioned earlier, you know, you've done this in, you know, town halls with hundreds of people. Um, you've done it in our school board meetings and you've taken, you know, face-to-face -face criticisms and um, you know, statements against what we're doing with incredible grace. And I've really, really admired that. Um, you certainly instill in me, a hope, you know, hope for our future, um, knowing that we've got, you know, young leaders like you, you know, coming behind us to, you know, keep things moving forward. I really, really appreciate it. And I wish you only the best. And I'm so excited we still get to work with you for the next year. Now, after all of this seriousness um, that we've heard, I, there's just something I have to say um, from someone who is always asked about my earrings, my shoes, you know, different fashion items. I just want to say I am really going to miss your fashion, inspiration, and creativity. You know, not seeing that on a more regular basis. You're amazing. Thank you so much. Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Thank you very much. And I, I, I want to echo everything my colleague said. Kimberly, I want to say one thing that one of my biggest regrets with this year and with COVID is not having the chance to really get to know you better. Um, so you know, I, I recognize that as my own failure and I wish I had had the time and the space to do that. Um, but from what I have seen and what I've heard from your statements, from your, your advocacy, I am so incredibly impressed by you and i'm not impressed by people very often so please understand that <laughs> i am so impressed by you you are fierce you're unapologetic you are strong you stand by your convictions and you push us forward but you do it in a way that makes us all stop and think and that is an incredible talent um when we've in our board meetings been faced with what i would consider very inappropriate statements your way of calling them out is not just calling them out but so rational so thoughtful so um in depth at how you get to your points and so well spoken that it doesn't just point out their inappropriate behavior but it makes me really think about my own thoughts and behavior and, and my own statements in a very positive way in your in your way of speaking kimberly you make the rest of the world think and, and that's an incredible talent, especially for someone of your age, an incredible power. And I hope you will always continue to use your words, your intelligence, your fierce and strength to make people think. And one of the things I have said for a long time is I think your generation is, is the next greatest generation. And you are the epitome and the proof of that. So I, for one, cannot wait to see what you do. I hope I actually can get to know you a little better next year. I'm so glad you're still here because I would love to be able to do that. And I am so honored to have been on this board with you. So with that, 
I wish you the best of luck. I hope you keep in touch and thank you for the gift of you this year. Ms. Marin. Yes, hi, Ms. Blackbang. Um, I echo all of the accolades of my colleagues and thank you for being so eloquent on behalf of yourself and your peers. You know, I don't know how easy it is for many students to be able to get up in public and express themselves. And, you know, you're, you're a model, you're showing how it's done. And that's a really special thing because not everyone has the guts or the skills to do it. So um, I hope that you all um, continue to be a resource to your successor, um, Mr. Nathan Anabudo. And um, I hope you have a great year. You're newly named school and feel so much pride when you walk through the doors there and know what you helped to achieve. And you, know, you have a really bright future. So um, I say think about the skills and the things that you want to you know, obtain and accumulate to help you get to where you want to be. But of course, uh, the, jo the joy is in the journey. So have fun. And um, thank you so much. I look forward to being in touch. And with that, I'm going to call a vote. All those in favor of the resolution honoring Kimberly Boateng, please show your hands. Ms. Cohen, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Marin, Dr. Anderson, Ms. Omej, Mr. Frisch, Ms. Darnak Koufax, Ms. Pekarski, Ms. Tolan, Ms. Sizemore Heiser, and Ms. Corbett Sanders. Ms. Keys Gamara. We've lost Ms. Keys Gamara. So that motion is unanimous with Ms. Keys Gamara away from the table. The motion is adopted. Now, Ms. Guateng, would you like to say a few words? Oh, yes. Uh, anyone who knows me knows I'm not the best with accepting compliments. So this was a lot. Um, I have more that I'll probably say like later in my student rep matters, but like this was truly amazing, an amazing experience. It was a complete honor to serve on the board. And also while I'm here, I want to show you guys the pretty little plaque I got. I'm not sure if you guys can see it well, but it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. I got it in the mail like two days ago and it'll be going like front and center so that whoever comes to my house can just see it. And it's just been wonderful. And I'm a crier, so I'm trying not to cry. So just want to say thank you for all your kind words, all your encouragement, all the affirmations. It means the world to me. It is our pleasure. And if you need a video submission for recommendations for college next fall, I think you have about a 25 minute one here that you can just have them send off and say, see how wonderful I am, because you have a lot of uh, cheerleaders for all the great stuff that you've done. The next order of business is, is citizen participation. Tonight, 14 citizens have signed up to address the board and we also have one video testimony. Speakers are requested to limit their remarks to no more than three minutes. The school board will not hear statements involving issues that have been scheduled for public hearings, such as capital improvement program budget and boundaries. Complaints regarding individual students or school-based employees should be directed to the appropriate school principal or other school official. Speakers should refrain from using personally identifiable information in connection with an individual student. Speakers are expected to deliver their comments with the decorum and respect appropriate to the conduct of the public's business. Thank you for your cooperation and thanks to those who have come to speak to us today. Our first speaker is Didi Isiad. Hi. Um, before I start, I just wanted to say hearing all you guys talk was really inspirational and I actually know Kimberly personally. So Kimberly, um, I think on behalf of all FCPS students, thank you for everything you've done and you're a really great friend. Um, but so. Hi, my name is DDL Sayad and I am a rising senior at Thomas Jefferson. Our FCPS deputy superintendent has already heard from me. I shared an article I wrote for my school newspaper regarding TJ's lack of diversity, and that is why I am here today. To some, diversity is a means of avoiding criticism. To others, diversity is stealing from more qualified races. But to me, diversity means that I belong. Diversity is needed to have a healthy and mature community. 
Diversity is a mixture of races and cultures and religions and genders and mental abilities and more. Diversity is embracing our differences and learning from each other. Less than 2% of TJ is Black. We need a diversity at TJ. But if you don't believe me, let me tell you what chaos ensues when diversity isn't present. Black people are less talented. Black people are less academically motivated. Black people are less qualified than other races to be at TJ. These are direct quotes from students here at TJ. The quotes are racist, yes. But how do these students know any better when they couldn't learn from other minority students in an advanced academic setting? Lack of diversity fosters prejudice. How are minorities impacted by a lack of diversity? My brother is an example. He was not admitted into the AAP program in elementary school. Now his attitude as a teenager towards advanced classes is, I can't handle it, I'm not smart enough. Lack of diversity shatters self-esteem of minority students. I want to embrace being Black. I want to embrace being a girl and being a Muslim and everything else that makes me me. But I can't do that right now because embracing these differences at TJ means embracing that I'm an outcast. I've been an outcast since third grade when I was one of two Black students in my AAP class. Now I am one of six Black students in my graduating class of 470. TJ is less than 2% Black. Minorities are severely underrepresented in AAP and as a result, lack of the confidence to take on more rigorous education. I do not fit in at TJ, but I am not alone. Many of us feel like we don't belong. There is a reason why TJ is less than 2% Black and it's not just the admissions process. It's because the AAP system has failed us. AAP fails minorities. It fails low-income students. It fails students with disabilities. AAP fails non-privileged students from eight years old. In honor of the Black Lives Matter movement, in honor of Pride Month, in honor of National Aphasia Awareness Month, in honor of all those boys and girls with dreams that might never come true because they never had a fighting chance, I beg you, make AAP for students with potential, not students with privilege. A meaningful and achievable first step would be increasing diversity in AAP programs. Make education a right not a privilege. Thank you. Thank you so much. Victoria Johnson. Hello, I'm her mom. Hi, Victoria. Um, first of all, happy LGBTQ plus month for everybody, Pride Month. Um, I come to you with celebration on my heart, but on my mind, it's uh, a challenge that I wanna present. And just hearing everyone speak you guys are already taking steps in that direction. So I'm talking about more of a global approach where we see it and we feel it. And working in the system, but also more importantly, being a parent, it's not there. So we know that we have a lot of work to do. I don't, I want, to, uh, I want us to use the language of not just our uh, community, but it's or excuse me, not that it's just their community, but it's our community. We're all a part of this. So I would love the day where I walk into a building and I see that it's a comfort place for all students. One example of that is the flag, a simple flag, whether it's flying in the, you know, beside our American flag or somewhere in our building. But it's not just in the counselor's office, it's in every place a student goes and that also, it's not seen, but it's felt. Um, yeah, so I feel like <clears throat> as a person in the community, especially as a person of color in the community, I feel like it's a double minority. So not only do I have to deal with being a black girl in America, I also have to deal with being a black LGBTQ plus member in America, which is, it's just a double minority. Not only do I have to fear about how I'm looked at by, you know, teachers and other peers about my race, also my sexuality, something I can't, another thing I can't, you know, and I just feel like, you know, what I've heard from other friends and what I've also experienced is just that you always feel kind of like an outcast. You never really feel, you know, like a quote unquote normal person. You never seem to fit the normality of what these students think is, you know, normal, right? So it just feels kind of hard. And I, I really don't know, I like, I'm, I'm all about celebrating and I know how far we've come, 
but I also feel like we have a lot more to do. And I just, there's just so many things that I know can be done to make us feel so much more comfortable in our school. But I do want to add, if you notice, it's Pride Month, it's in June, and we're out of school. Now, I know with the virtual learning, it's been very different. But if we look at every year, it's in June. So that's just even more reason why we need to celebrate throughout the school year, uh, whether it's for our Black students. It's not just Black history. We've heard this. It's all of our history. So I just think those steps through CTV. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Azra Nomani. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? We can hear you, Ms. Nomani. Thank you. So my name is Astra Nomani. I'm a former Wall Street Journal reporter who taught journalism at Georgetown University. My son is a rising senior at Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, and we have been in Fairfax County Public Schools since kindergarten. The number one priority for families is returning our students to school safely. FCPS and the school board have given parents two unacceptable options for our children's education, four days of distance learning or two days of in-school learning. For a school system with a $3 billion budget, these options are a failure. We are in a crisis, but instead of coming together to prioritize education, our school board is obsessed with partisan political activism and virtue signaling, hijacking our return to school with a divisive agenda that pits people against each other. The school board, our administrators and activists you will hear from tonight are diverting precious time, resources and money to renaming schools, removing mascots and indoctrinating our K through 12 students with a polarizing agenda driven curriculum fomented by a multi-million dollar industry of consultants doling out cookie cutter turnkey programs to activist school boards like Fairfax County. Call it what it is, Woke Incorporated. They are selling their products under buzzwords like critical race theory, anti-racism pedagogy, cultural Marxism, implicit bias training, and microaggression mediation. These are not terms that I invented. This is a language of divisive activists trying to indoctrinate our students. And when we don't even know how our kids are going to get back to school. And as you illustrated tonight, the FCPS school board has become an echo chamber for the big business of Woke Incorporated. TJ is a crucible for this activism. A small but aggressive group of alumni activists are hijacking our school with these virtue signaling knee-jerk solutions to increasing the number of Black, Hispanic, and other underrepresented groups at TJ. They, their demands include replacing the colonial mascot, the Thomas Jefferson name, and our race-blind admissions process with race-based lotteries and quotas. Their ideas have even included occupying TJ. The alumni now call the idea a, quote, joke, but to us, our children's safety is no laughing matter. We all agree on increasing diversity and addressing racial issues. I'm a Muslim immigrant from India who learned English as a second language and ate free breakfast in school provided to children living in poverty. I'm part of a socioeconomic minority as a single mother. We disagree on solutions. We must build a pipeline to success at TJ and all schools. Instead, our TJ principal sent to our mostly immigrant families of color a letter telling us we had to check our privilege, another divisive rhetorical product sold by Woke Incorporated. A TJ mother who marched for human rights in Tiananmen Square told me she feels like an outcast. I'm having traumatic flashbacks to the cultural revolution in China, she said. We must protect our students and families from the divisive snake oil activism of the industry. Thank you, Ms. Nomani. Incorporated. Thank, Thank you. you. Kimberly Adams. Kimberly? Here I am. Good afternoon. My name is Kimberly Adams, and I am speaking on behalf of our union, Fairfax Education Association. Thank you all for recognizing Pride Month in our school system. The FEA stands with the LGBTQ plus community and supporting all people in their right to choose whom they love and to be respected for that choice. Thank you, Ms. Batang, for your service. We appreciated the time we had to learn from and with you. You inspire us with your leadership, and we look forward to closely working and following your future endeavors, perhaps someday a return to this board. The FEA will continue to work with you and your fellow classmates as we move through these difficult times. Please know that all FCPS employees are dedicated to our students and families. As we leave the current school year, we know FCPS has struggled with addressing employee concerns, some of them for years. The FEA has always been here to help. 
Collaboration is critical, especially during this time of pandemic. We thank you as a school board and the leadership team for responding to your employees. This is an amazing opportunity to become a school district that truly listens to its employees and makes progress because of its partnerships. Thank you all for your time and your talents. We continue to work together towards a better school year ahead. Thank you. Susan Danowitz. Hi, members of the school board. My name is Kristen Wong, and I graduated from TJ in 2007. Susan Danowitz kindly ceded her time to me. Thanks for listening. As you discuss committee appointments, I wanted to touch on the importance of diversity. Specifically, I'm here today asking you to address TJ's lack of diversity. When I was at TJ, my class had four black students, and to hear that the number of black students at TJ remains pretty much the same 13 years later is heartbreaking. I don't want any more kids to go through what I had to. I had fond memories of my time at TJ. I received a great education and I met lifelong friends. But 13 years later, the blatant racism that I had to deal with is fresh in my memory. I'll never forget walking down the hallway, hearing two white kids throwing the N-word back and forth between each other, only looking a little bit sheepish when they noticed that I was there. I'll never forget the countless times I heard, oh, well, you'll get into X school, you're black. And I'll never forget the many, many insensitive classroom comments. My classmates refusing to see any benefit in affirmative action or defending Don Imus after he called a group of college athletes nappy-headed hoes. Apparently, his right to free speech was more important than my right to live in a world that didn't denigrate my body and my blackness. The truth is, I don't think my classmates were out to get me or that they didn't like me because I was black. It's just that most TJ students are completely ignorant when it comes to issues of race. You can go an entire four years at TJ and never directly speak to a black person. These students are supposed to be our future leaders and they don't know how to relate to people outside their bubbles. And the diversity problem isn't just an issue of the student population. Diversity among TJ faculty is just as important. I remember in 2005 going on an extra extracurricular school trip to Atlanta, and the first place we visited was Stone Mountain, the site of America's largest monument to the Confederacy and the birthplace of the modern Ku Klux Klan. This was 2005. I was completely blindsided, and it put a huge damper on what should have been a fun bonus trip. Also, we did not visit any sites related to the civil rights movement, despite being in the hometown of Martin Luther King Jr. Again, I don't think the teacher planned this trip in a malicious way, and I think she just didn't think about the implications of the sites that we were visiting. And I'm sure if there had just been, you know, a little bit more diversity on the faculty, maybe someone would have helped her think twice about having students visit a Klan rally site. And that's the thing about diversity. Like, at the end of the day, it really just comes down to having diverse voices in the room. You know, no amount of bias training or anti-racism education can make up for having Black voices present to fix the education of TJ students and to improve upon the experiences of students like me. You really need to increase diversity at the school and you need to do so immediately. Thank you. Ruth Metzel. I want to first thank Ruth Metzel for sharing her time with me. My name is Christine Contreras Slaughter and I'm a Latina class of 2007 TJ grad. I was in sixth grade when I first heard about TJ after being invited to join Quest, a minority enrichment program with a goal of preparing students for the TJ entrance exam. The Quest program introduced me to a world that I had previously been kept out of. I suddenly had new goals and I knew TJ would be a stepping stone towards accomplishing my dreams. As a participant in the program, I quickly learned that I was not being adequately prepared in my non-AAP class, math in particular. I looked forward to taking the middle school math placement test so that I could finally be placed into a math class that would be at my level. To my surprise, I was told that I was not allowed to take the math placement test, and I was placed into a standard seventh grade math class while I was desperately trying to catch up so that I could have a chance at getting into TJ. I once asked my seventh grade math teacher for help with the topic I was learning about in Quest, and she angrily told me to look it up myself in her college textbook because she didn't know how to do it. I attended Stone and Liberty Middle Schools. The data has shown that students who attend non-AAP middle schools are quite unlikely to make the first TJ cut and have almost no chance of being admitted. I had all the cards stacked against me, and yet somehow 
I made it. Me, a brown, first generation born, non-AAP student, made it. I was the exception, a rare case, and that is the problem. Year after year, the number of Black and Latinx students admitted to TJ remains so low that we do not even make up 5% of the student body combined. I had to work unnecessarily hard to get into TJ in order to make up for opportunities that were taken away from me. As a student at TJ, I was met with comments such as, you only got in because you're Hispanic. It is isolating to not see yourself reflected in the faces of your peers and teachers. And it is traumatizing to have to defend your worth on a daily basis due to the implicit bias and racism that breeds in a community severely lacking in diversity. When I expressed concerns about the number of Black and Latinx students admitted and retained at TJ, I received claims from people in opposition to reform that those who work the hardest and are the brightest are the ones who get in. Ask yourself, is it that Black and Latinx students don't work hard enough or aren't smart enough? Or is it that the system was designed to make us fail? I know the answer is the latter, and it is your responsibility as something. Dismantle the current TJ admissions process and the AAP screening process in order to create a new system that will allow all students, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, or socioeconomic status, to reach their full p potential. Give us the chance to thrive. Thank you. Ma'am, could you please uh, provide to the clerk your name and as well as the previous speaker's name and uh, speaking notes because uh, we have two different, we have the wrong names registered, but we so appreciate you coming and speaking to us tonight. Sebastian Ibarohan. Uh, hello. Seven. Hi, Sebastian. Hello. Sorry. Um, so, hello. Uh, considering the admissions data for the class of 2024, I wanted to share my experience as a Latino student at Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology. During my junior year, I decided to run for an elected position. I walked up to the stage in front of TJ's packed auditorium and began my speech by saying my name, Sebastián Ibarrarán, in Spanish. The audience burst out laughing. As a Mexican-American student at TJ, an experience like this was not unusual in the slightest. I was instantly taken back to the day I was admitted to TJ when a friend told me that I had only gotten in because I am Mexican. My freshman and sophomore years were characterized by putting up with an uncomfortable amount of race-related humor, hearing casual use of racial slurs everywhere, and a complete lack of education from the school about the history of racism in our country. Junior and senior years also included a return to what I had first faced from a TJ peer in the eighth grade, persistent vilification, claiming that I did not deserve my accomplishments because of my ethnicity, that I would have to work less hard than others for the same reason, or that my accomplishments meant less because they must have been gifted to me. The election speech incident felt like a culmination of all of these experiences, so it became the focal point of my personal statement when I applied to college. As I began my second semester at Yale in January, I decided to view my partial admissions file and reflect on my journey through TJ. When I reached the review of my personal statement, the admissions officer who evaluated me wrote that it was, quote, sad but unsurprising that students would behave this way, unquote. The fact that the admissions office at one of our country's top academic institutions is not surprised at my experiences at TJ is a scathing indictment of what it has become. TJ has not been a welcoming environment for the few Black, Latinx, and low-income students that managed to attend for so long, and it has become a widely inaccessible public resource to these groups in Fairfax County. I demand the following actions from the FCPS school board. One, to fundamentally reform the admission system in such a manner that actively creates a racially and socioeconomically diverse student body. The only way to create a more inclusive space for underrepresented groups in an intellectual area is to represent them beyond the margins, and the admissions process is the most direct avenue for action in this regard. Admissions is not just a symptom. It is unequivocally the main part of the problem itself. Two, to create an actively anti-racist curriculum at TJ and across FCPS to educate students on the experiences of marginalized groups in the United States. I am encouraged by the school board's discussion about this, and I'm excited to see this incorporated in Fairfax County classrooms. And three, reforming the AAP program in Fairfax County to improve representation for Black, Latinx, and low-income students. AAP is absolutely one of the largest barriers to entry at TJ. But this should not be a priority only because of TJ. This is a problem that needs to be addressed on its own, and it should not be an alternative, but rather a complement to reforming the admissions process. I believe that every student in FCPS deserves a fair chance to re realize whether or not their life's passion lies in STEM. I know the school board does too, so please, please support these proposals that I have lined out. Thank you. Thank you. 
Haya Mohanty Ortiz. Hello, uh, my name is Jordan Cosson and I'm actually sitting in for Chaya Ortiz. So first, let me say thank you to Chaya for succeeding the time and for the board and everybody else who's listening, please bear with me. A lot of good information has been shared about the LGBT community. So some of what I'm about to say may be a bit repetitive. So again, I already said my name is Jordan Costin. I'm the executive director of Safe Space NOLA. It's a pleasure being with you here today for um, during Pride Month. For those who don't know, Pride Month is a promotion of the self-affirming dignity, equality, and increased visibility of lesbian gay, bisexual, and transgender people as a social group. Pride, as opposed to shame and social stigma, is a predominant outlook that blockbusters most LGBT rights movements. It was initiated after the Stonewall riots were started by two trans women of color, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. As a state, we've made tremendous strides. Most recently, we've had the Virginia Cares Act, which extends existing state non-discrimination protections and public employment, housing, and credit to Virginians on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, and several other characteristics. This is great news, as I'm a gay man, I'm glad to hear it. However, there's work to be done. Based on a 2015 Youth Risk Behavior Survey from the CDC, that's Center for Disease Control, of surveyed LGBT students, 10% were threatened or injured with a weapon on school property, 34% were bullied on school property, and 28% were bullied electronically. Those issues still exist. How do I know? because of the work I do with PFLAG and Safe Space Nova. We work with young LGBTQ youth who continuously feel bullied and tormented, not just by their peers, but by other adults to, to include teachers and administrators as well. At Safe Space Nova, our goal is to provide a safe, accepting, and supportive environment to combat social stigmas, bullying, and other challenges faced by LGBTQ youth. We do this by hosting social activities free of charge to the youth who attend. We also have a new group called YALS, which stands for Youth Advocacy and Leadership Learning Through Social Support. The purpose of the group is to provide a supervised, inclusive, and affirming space for LGBT youth to come together, support one another, and feel supported as they live authentically. The group is youth-driven, but facilitated to help young people develop leadership and advocacy skills, create educational programming targeted at peers, adults, and ensure safety. Lastly, um, just last year, actually, we actually launched our scholarship program, which we actually started giving scholarships to some of our youth who are matriculating to Safe Space Nova, graduating and going off to college. Our target age group is 14 to 18 years old across all of Northern Virginia to include the city of Alexandria, Arlington County, Fairfax County, Prince William County, and Loudoun County. So why am I here? I'm here to say that Safe Space Nova is here. We've been here for the past four years. We exist. And we want to partner with the high schools and with the school board to let the students do the career. Thank you, Jordan. Please provide your information and your remarks to the clerk, and uh, we'll make sure the whole board has your information. Okay. Davina Johnson. Good afternoon. Davina Johnson graciously ceded her time to me. My name is Siobhan Smith. I'm a math teacher and an equity lead at West Potomac High School. I'm also a co-president of FCPS Pride and a board member of Fairfax County Anti-Racist Minds. Pride Month represents and celebrates the challenges of the LGBTQ community to be acknowledged, affirmed, and validated in our collective communities. I am grateful to be able to speak on the day that Fairfax County Public Schools acknowledge the work and the efforts of Kimberly Botting on behalf of FCPS Pride and FAM, Fairfax Anti-Racist Minds and Region 3, thank you Kimberly for your service. Both as an educator and a member of FCPS Pride and the FAM, I would like to recognize, validate and affirm those efforts today because for Pride, because I can and society at large never can't and society at large never seem to let go of my own intersectionality. And sometimes their struggles, their bias creates barriers. The intersectionality of our LGBTQ students, staff, and the areas of gender, sexuality, and race is important to acknowledge and affirm not only in June, the LGBTQ Pride Month, but ongoing. Simply being smart, intelligent, making good grades, and following the rules does not combat the challenges of othering, racism, sexism, and gendering. To support my LGBTQ students, 
families, colleagues, and I task myself, my school community, and our school system moving forward to affect the caring, welcoming, and safe environment for LGBTQ students, families, colleagues, and allies, allies by moving forward to action, by acknowledging and supporting. Please uplift our student voices. Please uplift our staff voices. Please uplift our community voices. Thank you for all for the opportunity to speak today during Pride Month. Happy Pride Month and stay safe, Fairfax County. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Can you please provide your information to the clerk? Appreciate that. Suparna Dutta. Good evening. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, I'm trying to share my video. It's not letting me, but that's okay. I thought I was too busy to school to speak at a school board meeting, but recently there's been a rash of emails sent from Superintendent Scott Braban, the high school principals, and members of this board. Some were about options to resume the next school year, while others self-righteously told me to check my privilege and prepare for curriculum changes. Today, I did not hear a single remark from the school board about raising academic excellence. And it is a school board, right? An email on Tuesday listed options for next year, including four days of online instruction or a minimum of two days of in-school instruction and independent study for the rest. Last quarter, there were ongoing technical problems with the school platforms and often teachers and students would have to leave the classroom and reconnect. With already short instruction time, it didn't help when a teacher couldn't get into class until five to 10 minutes after the start time. FCPS failed the students in spring and it looks like they're resigned to do the same this fall. When so many schools across the world have opened up, why is FCPS lagging behind? I come from a very humble family and a part of the developing world. I came here to study and search for better opportunities. I was alone with no family. I had to motivate myself to find those opportunities. There were hardships and disappointments, and I worked long hours and pinched every penny to get where I am. I never asked for a handout, and no one gave me an opportunity without getting my best effort. I was privileged just to have parents who raised me that way. From their modest flat in a hectic, congested city on the other side of the world, they are shocked by the things you now say about us in your emails and the transformation you promise is coming. Emails from teachers, principal, and Bonitatibas complain about admissions outcomes and an equity gap. When did schools shift focus from hard work and merit to race or anything other than academics? This is not the America I immigrated to or want to see for my kids. In my child's admission year, only 19% are white. Is TJ's admission policy biased against whites? The principal's logic says so, but I don't believe it. The public schools seem bent on pitting one group of people against another and making children feel the brunt of it. Your brand of social justice sounds to me like a rigid ideology using conjecture instead of data. It isn't falsifiable, it is unscientific and against the habits needed for any useful discipline. It will fail to deliver. Most Americans don't pursue STEM because they think it's too hard. According to research, there should be an effort to attract more kids at the elementary level. Eliminating competitive admissions, though, dismisses the high desire and academic standards needed for success in STEM. A curriculum redesigned to spell social Thank you very much, Thank you. Jorge Torrico. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, school board. Great to address you again. Although my affiliation says TJ AAG, I am a concerned individual TJ Visions UV alumni and Fairfax County parent. I'm raising my voice out of concern for the kids who are and have yet to be at TJ. For the record, I am not paid to speak here. I'm not a part of a race war. In fact, it's not a, ra a war of any kind. It's about an interrupting the academic arms race. I do not have a large public forum, but I do care about TJ finding the missing talent that exists in Fairfax County, Los Diamantes Perdidos. My wife and I are both naturalized citizens. I'm from Bolivia, she is from South Korea, but I was a low income dreamer before the term was coined. The education we both received allowed us as immigrants to be able to improve our lots in the US, and I'm grateful for the visions TJ and UVA for that. We're fortunate enough to be of low, uh, not be of low income, but amidst our privilege, we still face structural issues. For example, with our kids, we paid after school care. And even uh, when we wanted them to participate in local activities, 
uh, put on by the local PTA, those are hard to attend, not just because we are paying $1,650 per month already, but then also the cost for each of those potential activities. And the school that my children went to is Sangster that accepts over 54% of its population through the AAP program. That is how my kids got there. But the school did not reserve or make spots for the after school care program there, even though uh, they know full well how many kids are coming. During that time, my kids were not able to attend after school activities in either school because they had to be on the bus to get to Cherry Run. And they, by the time they arrived there, all activities were done and they couldn't attend the ones in Sangster. I brought this up in three times with the principal in a public setting at the family orientation upon admission. And each time the principal did not apologize, did not empathize, and the bureaucratic layers allowed the school to behave in this manner. I reached out to the provider, in this case, Fairfax County government, nothing changed. And yet each of the three times I spoke up, many parents thanked me for speaking up. The academic enrichment profile for my kids now is greatly reduced after the school involvement was limited. Is it because they're not working hard? Is it because we didn't encourage them? Is it because they're not interested? No, this is the definition of disparate treatment. Even if we want to provide equal access for our kids, we couldn't because we both had to work. Now, even if my children uh, ultimately get into college and they don't go to TJ, we do recognize our privilege and we understand that we're in a much better position. But I want to speak for the people who can't the people who don't have that option. And there are many of those people in our community with 28% of our current county population as low income uh, socioeconomic class uh, students. That is a big call to action. The fact that TJ for the past 27 years has only admitted less than two and a half percent of low economic students. And that's why I'm here. I'm here to try to uh, allow for more people to be able to become a part or have the access or have the option to apply. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Torrico. Kiribo Akiyu. Hello, uh, I'm class of Jefferson 2017. Um, I'm the son of two Ethiopian immigrants and I moved to Virginia when I was five years old. I attended Crestwood Elementary through second grade and entered a AAP through Springfield State Elementary and Torrey Middle School. Unlike some of my peers who had been in TJ and SAT courses since elementary, my entire test prep consisted of having ordered a prep at TJ, I was an officer and president of Black Student Union and SAC representative. Now, the issues that I see with Jefferson follow. First, many people claim that TJ has a meritocratic admissions process. I would argue the opposite. The current admissions process is biased to those who can afford TJ test prep courses. Additionally, a large percentage of Jefferson students come from a small chunk of eligible middle schools, and they have access to clubs like TSA or Science Olympiad or they can attend STEM summer courses and they are able to leverage this experience in their admissions uh, packet. The current process implicitly benefits the wealthy and ex excludes the poor, hence the annual 2% or less for the launch percentage. Now, to some of my personal experiences at Jefferson, countless times my peers said I only got into TJ due to being Black, despite the process being supposedly race blind. In my four years as part of the Black Student Union, I tried to educate and advocate for black voices. Many of my non-black peers would refer to black students as not really being black and make snide affirmative action comments towards them. Blackness is seen as nothing more than an advantage for college admissions and is ignored when trying to address real issues. This is not even to mention the rampant use of the N-word and other racial slurs during my time at school. Efforts by the BSU to educate the student population were never taken seriously. The environment itself, which has come about from a lack of diversity in admissions, has caused undue additional stress upon black students. In my freshman class alone, two out of the six black students sit in return for their sophomore year. Students were not the only ones who were racially insensitive. During my freshman year, I asked the teacher a simple question regarding where to sit in the classroom. She yelled at me, what a stupid question. Someone must have taken the TJ test for me, insinuating that I didn't belong. I was also a student who was on free or reduced lunch for most of my time in SCPS. It was only at Jefferson where I felt isolated due to my family's financial status. At other schools, it was much more common. At Jefferson, I once spoke to peer about this and I was ridiculed as a result. Jefferson caters to the wealthiest families and has become a place for wealthy parents to fast track their children to a successful and high-paying STEM job. 
I believe TJ and SCPS have been so reluctant to alter the admissions process because of the success of the, of the school in national rankings. However, as it stands, students that graduated from TJ don't fit SCPS's portrait of a graduate. Thank you, Mr. Akiyu. Thank you. Joseph Kim. Hi, is my audio working? Yes, it is. Hi, my name is Joseph Kim, and I'm a 2018 graduate of Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, and I'm currently a student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. For the past three weeks, the topic of racial diversity at TJ has been at the forefront of the minds of hundreds of alumni, parents, and students. Unfortunately, the inequities in the TJ system have not been relegated to the past three weeks, and this has been a problem ever since TJ was founded in 1985. In its entire 35-year history, TJHSST has never had more than 9.4% of its student population to be comprised of Black and Hispanic students. In the last 20 years, that number has hovered at about half of that maximum. But at this point, we're all well aware of what the problem is. The outcry makes that very clear. What we need now are real solutions. A fellow alumnus, Justin Bui, and I have been working hard to find bold and effective solutions to address the problem of diversity at Thomas Jefferson. After poring over dozens of studies, court cases, and news articles, Justin and I have written a full 26-page report of the history of racial injustice in TJ admissions with data and evidence-backed proposals for change. We'd be more than happy to present our findings to any and all members of the school board, but I'll do my best to present some of the key ideas now. The research and examples of other selective high school systems across the country show that admitting students from a top percentage of each middle school will be the most effective admissions process for promoting diversity at TJ. More specifically, offering admission to the top 15% of applicants from each middle school will open the door for students from more diverse and underrepresented communities. The problem, however, isn't entirely isolated to the direct admissions process. Steps need to be taken to promote inclusivity at all levels, including AAP outreach. During the last school year alone, Black students were 32% underrepresented in level four AAP. Hispanic students were 61% underrepresented. As a major gatekeeper to admission success, this is unacceptable and needs to change. And after hearing all the testimonials, even from today, from Black and Hispanic students and alumni concerning the inhospitable environment at TJ, it's clear that steps need to be taken to help support BIPOC students within TJ as well. Active learning techniques alongside mental health and stress management intervention program have been shown to decrease the course failure rate of underrepresented groups in STEM by nearly half and increased feelings of belonging and emotional satisfaction. Anti-racism and imposter syndrome awareness workshops need to be implemented immediately as well. It's not enough to help black students just get past the admissions process. We need to create an inclusive atmosphere for all students. The solutions aren't simple and they aren't easy, but facing racism on a day-to-day -day basis and having to jump systemic hurdles isn't easy either. The answers are multifaceted and they can't be summed up in three minutes, but the solutions are there. We just need to be willing to work on them and put real change into action. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Kim, and please send your research to the board. Mr. Becerra, George can Becerra. I can hear you, George. Yes. Good afternoon, school board members and Superintendent Brayman. There are several items that I would like to talk about. First is the Superintendent's Technology Advisory Council. Did the board agree that out of the 18 adults who are on the steering committee, that no member is an underrepresented minority person? We have 16 white and two Asian adults. The other person is a child or a student. There are those some underrepresented minorities in the role as advisory members. To me, this, this is like saying you are fine at the kiddies table, but not at the main table. I may understand that this council was struck quickly under the tremendous failure of the rollout of distance learning, but I hope that next time a group of this caliber it stood up that there will be some lens of equity and equality. Second thing I'd like to talk about is the vote you will have the school board during your first meeting in July on who the next chairman is. I think the times dictate a person who is an underrepresented minority and has the experience to do this. The last time a person who met these criteria was Mrs. Isis Castro in 2003 from the Mount Vernon district, uh, where before Mr. Uh, Supervisor Stork. Whom you choose your own, your own internal power plan and alliance formation decision, none others. Also remember the new voted on chairman will guide the board through the process of renewing the superintendent's contract for another four years or start the process of finding a new one. This decision has to be made more than likely, I think, no later than October. Plus at the same time, 
hire about three or four new leadership team members, if not more by the time the summer ends. Third, will the board announce and put on the agenda during one of the July meetings that the superintendent's evaluation for the past year has been completed and a general summary of it has been provided to the public under the Code of Virginia, just like the notification the Board of Supervisors do annually with the county executive evaluation. Finally, thank you, Ch thank you Chairman Corbett Sanders and Superintendent Brayman for allowing the MSAOC to have a representative on the panel choosing the next Chief of Academics and Equity Office. MSAOC voted last night and that person will be me. Thank you very much and hope everyone stays safe. Thank you, Mr. Becerra. We now have a video testimony by Robert Rigby. Good afternoon, school board members, Marshall Bradburn, and senior staff. My name is Robert Rigby, Jr. I am co-president of FCPS Pride, an employees and guardians group concerned with LGBTQ people in Fairfax County Public School. We are planning on doing three things this week that symbolically will move us forward in the concept of equity. You are beginning the public hearings to change the name of Lee High School, and you have begun the process of changing the name of Mosby Woods Elementary School. Nowhere in any school system should Confederates be honored. These are good steps that you are taking. You also will honor our student representative, Kimberly Watang. I have listened to most of her statements to this board, and she is a real hero to me. I especially appreciated her focus on bias and adverse students. She has been an excellent voice for our students this year, and I suspect she will remain so during her senior year. You will have recognized LGBTQ Pride Month. Pride Month is in June in remembrance of the events at the Stonewall Inn in New York City in 1969. It is worth reminding people who criticized the street protests against white supremacy that the first pride was a riot led by a transgender woman of color. Even though that woman, Marsha B. Johnson, led the way for the whole community at Stonewall, life still remains extraordinarily difficult for LGBTQ students in our schools, with the extra burdens being placed on transgender students an African-American immigrant and disabled LGBTQ students and, and other people in our schools. The legal world around LGBTQ people in our schools is changing. This year, Virginia passed a law mandating that school systems develop and implement policies for trans students. The Supreme Court of the United States said last week that trans people cannot be discriminated against in employment decisions. And the last brief in Gavin Grimm's case will be filed tomorrow. I fully expect the appeals court to rule within a few weeks that students cannot be discriminated against just because they are transgender. The world is changing, and it's good to see FCPS change with it. I will make a special appeal that when we develop the policy for transgender students, that we create a student-centered policy and not allow adults to have veto power over students' gender identity. Thank you for listening. The next part of our agenda is student representative matters. I now call on Ms. Boateng. Hi, so I'm back again. Um, and this is like my last student rep matters. This is crazy. Um, who would have thought that it'd be here? You see, in the beginning of my term, I didn't think that I'd be giving it on my bed, in my bedroom. But here we are, and uh, there's so much that I could say, and this is a very bittersweet moment for me, but don't worry, I won't cry. I did that earlier. Um, this week has been absolutely insane for me. For those who aren't aware, I haven't been like keeping up or whatever, uh, during this term, I've weathered the name change, my school name change process, I think technically I can say twice. Um, I've been a part of the election and onboarding of a new board. So I'm, in for I'm fortunate to have experienced a little bit of two boards. And I've been a part of this pandemic with everybody. So I think it's safe to say it's been a wild ride. Um, I just also want to take the time to kind of share like a little like story not really a story but 
we're going to call it a story just for, you know, word's sake. Um, and uh, the reason why is because, um, this, I've been on this board and I've been talking for, you know, Lord knows how long. And I just feel that a lot of people don't really know, like me as a person, like what in my own circumstances, they know my views and they know where I go to school, but they don't really know a little bit of my background. So I just want to say that during the school year, I've kind of spent this position kind of like airbending my way out of through obstacles. Um, for those who don't know, I'm a rising senior and I'm also someone who does not drive and my parents both work jobs, you know, to make support my family. So it was up to me to get myself around to get everything done to my best of the ability. So what that meant was many, many buses and a lot of walking and a lot of communication with my teachers, my parents, my family and all of that. So the people are like, probably like, why did she just share that? And the reason why is because as a lower income student, I often feel as if there are, these are stories that often don't see the light, reach the light. And there are many students who may look at me and be like, oh yeah, I wish I could do what she's doing, but I just don't have devices. Like I just, I don't have a car. I don't have this. I don't have that. And I'm here to say that while it's, it's definitely been harder for me since I don't have certain resources, like I don't have transportation, like that's as comfortable. Um, it's definitely possible. Um, it's, if, for me, I actually got lucky for when I missed a bus or when plans fell through, I always was able to rely on Uber. But many students don't, did, were, aren't able to do that, but still push through. So I also want to highlight that. Um, much of my position this year has been me just figuring things out. And I feel that's a little beautiful. Like I like to tell people, hey, it's okay if you don't know what's going on, because frankly, I don't either. And I feel that that type of honesty is what brings people together and brings like, ge like genuity to this whole process. Um, while I don't think I'll be going into politics for a couple of reasons, I still hope that whatever I have been trying to exude, I'm very big on being true to myself and raw and human. And I feel I hope that soon that this will become more commonplace in our places of office. I vowed to stay true to how I dress to the bright hair colors people have seen throughout the year, my purple and blue. I know blue is a favorite for a lot of people and especially my vernacular, how I speak. Like if I have a certain accent, if I have certain words that I want to say like, oh, but it's too, pro it's not professional. I don't like professionalism. Everyone, I've said that multiple times. I don't like it because I feel as if it's too stringent and it kind of takes away from the humanity that we so truly need in these positions. So with that, I kind of want to say thanks to everyone who's been supportive of me, pushing me out of my comfort zone so I can do this to the best of my ability. And also while I'm here, I wasn't, I wasn't able to speak to um, it on Tuesday. It, yeah, Tuesday, because I actually went to go get groceries during the vote, but I'm absolutely thrilled about the name change. It's been a long time coming. I also want to take the opportunity to shout out a specific person because I've been getting a flood of like congratulations, good jobs, but I also want to make sure I don't want to it'd be wrong for me to take all the um, credit. I want to shout out my um, fellow Lee High School student, well, formerly Lee High School student, um, Luna Alazar. She's class of 2020 graduate, and she's been the one who really spearheaded the whole thing. So I want to make sure she gets the props that she deserves. She's been a powerhouse with that. And she's the one who has consistently been like pushing me to speak on it. So I want to make sure that she knows. So thank you, Luna, for continuously pushing to me to be loud about it, even when I didn't want to. Like, she always was fearless about it. Um, this was a hard position. I'm not going to lie, but I wouldn't trade this experience for anything. I am excited for where we're going. I hope to see a lot more positive change, and I know this board is going to be able to do it. And in terms of like ESOP programs to better integrate our immigrant populations into the student body, anti-racist curriculums, like we talked about before, continued emphasis on equity and resource allocation, discipline, mental health, increased avenue for meaningful student engagement. And I can go on forever and ever, and y'all know that because I talk a lot, y'all have seen the most of it. Um, but like I said, and like many of the school members have said, I'm still here for one more year and I got a little sister who's here for five more years. So watch out, uh, you guys have not gotten, seen the last of me. And for Nathan, I look forward to the amazing work that you're gonna do in this upcoming year. And always, I'm always a text away. So thank you everyone for an unforgettable year. Thank you, Kimberly. Mm -hmm. 
We did not take any actions around our closed meeting, so I'm going to go to item six, our consent agenda. Our adopted rules of parliamentary procedure, Robert's Rules, provides for a consent agenda listing several items for approval of the board by a single motion. Many items have gone through board review and documentation has been provided to all board members and the public in advance. Items may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of any board member prior to the meeting. Item 6.01, appoint individuals to serve on committees as detailed in the agenda item. Item 6.02, appoint individuals to serve for a one-year term ending June 30th, 2021 on the Adult and Community Education, Advanced Academic Programs, Career and Technical Education, Human Resources, Minority Student Achievement Oversight, School Health, and Students with Disabilities Advisory Committees, as listed in the agenda item. Item 6.03, confirm the contract for Elazar Martinez, Executive Director and Chief Investment Officer for the ERFC. Is there any objection to approving the consent agenda? Ms. Barron, your hand is up. Ms. Marin? No, that's an error, sorry. That's okay. Hearing and seeing no objection, the consent agenda is approved. Item seven, new business. The following are new business agenda items. There will not be a vote tonight on these items, but action is scheduled at a future meeting. 7.01, authorize the division superintendent chief operating officer or the assistant superintendent for facilities and transportation services any of whom may act without the others in consultation with legal counsel for the school system to negotiate execute and administer on behalf of the school board a lease agreement for the office of facilities management's northwest maintenance support center located at 397 herndon parkway herndon virginia 20170 including all related documentation within available funds. Item eight, superintendent matters. Next on the agenda is superintendent matters and I call on Dr. Braybrand. Thank you, Chairman Corbett Sanders. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to talk to you all this evening. Uh, I wanna start by first saying, Kimberly, congratulations on an amazing year as a student representative. You have been an amazing voice. Uh, you really have had an opportunity tonight to hear from all of your colleagues the kind of impact you've had on the school system. And I'm very excited that you're gonna be with us another year and your voice will continue to be heard. And that is part of our journey is to make sure that all of our students' voices are being heard and respected and included. So I congratulate you and I look forward to uh, watching your senior year uh, at a new uh, high school with a new name. And uh, I wanna thank the board for all the continued work they're doing to honor um, uh, our, uh, our, our folks, our staff members. Um, and as we work on return to school, we're gonna continue to communicate out and share with you the information that you need to make the choices that you need as we do return to school. So that's all I have for this evening. And I look forward to seeing all of you again real soon. Thank you. Now for board committee reports. And I call on Do Mrs. Derenak Koufax for an update on the forum held earlier today. Yes, Ms. Corbett Sanders, we did help hold a forum earlier today and discussed one agenda item brought forth to us by Ms. Cullen. The topic was what steps with timelines and actionable items can be taken to immediately, both short-term and long-term, eliminate racism and implicit bias in FCPS. The objectives what the objective of the conversation was with the year-end review of the budget upcoming, I would like the board to see what immediate, both short-term and long-term actions can we take to improve FCPS with regard to racism and implicit bias. Ms. Cohen listed several topics for discussion, including school name changes, hiring practices, including both recruitment and diversity deserts, professional development, including building wide on racism and cultural competency, the SRNR items, including dress code, discipline disparities, appeals, hearings, culturally competent discipline procedures, consistent offerings, and 
use of racial slurs. Um, under AAP and TJ, young scholars compacted math, local level four, admissions to centers, and admission to TD, TJ. School-specific interventions and training around anti-racism through town halls, microaggression, remediation, tackling overt racism, anti-racist curriculum, um, SROs, um, and, and their role in the schools, general disparities by race and building specific disparities and truancy. Uh, there was a robust conversation followed by unanimous support from this board. This was referred to a work session and I assume there will be several work sessions on these many topics. So thank you, Ms. Cohen. Thank you, Ms. Derenak Kofax. I now call, this next section is board matters and I call on Dr. Anderson. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to everyone for listening and Kimberly, good luck and it was really great serving with you for the time that we were able to work together. Very briefly, I just want to be sure that I acknowledge that we know that the return to um, school plan that were that was discussed earlier this week and that our parents received communication about is causing no less than a lot of consternation for our teachers, our parents and just everyone else. And I'm right along there with you. You know, as a parent, I'm trying to determine what is going to be best for my two kids, one of them who's transitioning to another level. Um, it, these are hard decisions and we do understand there's a lot of questions. We see all the questions because I think everyone's email has been flooded with the questions that our community has and they're good and valid questions. Uh, my, my commitment is to ensure that we have those questions answered so that we can be informed in our decision-making um, those questions are being forwarded to the leadership um, team who are working tirelessly to make sure that we we provide that information that our community deserves. Um, and we want to be able to move forward together. And again, folks, I hope that there's some recognition that, and I know there is, there's a, there's a deep recognition that this is a, a very difficult situation. Uh, we have um, we have uh, portions of our community who want all virtual. We have portions of our community who want all return back five days a week. And we have to find ways to be responsive to, to all of that. So just please keep the questions coming. And I don't think I need to encourage you to do that, but keep them coming and we will address them because we have to. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Ms. Cohen. I, uh, I never thought mar marrying up into a C, Cohen would, uh, would, would changed my life so exponentially. Um, I I just want to echo what Dr. Anderson said. I will add on to that that the majority of about the 250 communications I've gotten since Monday afternoon are mostly from teachers who are really seeking further clarity of expectations, who are very concerned about child care, who are concerned about workload, we're concerned about how decisions will be made um, building wide, but also in coordination with the health department, in particular in concerns of areas that we see with really high concentrations of COVID. Uh, we hear you uh, and we are gonna continue to work with staff to get answers. They hear you. Uh, we expect an FAQ will come out on Friday that will help answer some questions I know that more will be coming out uh, to our staff to help them understand the process and procedures for how decisions will be made um, and hopefully relieve some of the heartburn so that decisions can be made this week about whether you're going to return um, or have to take a break. And I certainly hope you're going to return. We don't want to lose any of you. So um, we appreciate you. We know that this is such a difficult time. As Ricky said, or Dr. Anderson said, uh, we we feel it in our own home with two kids here and um, we're all gonna get through this together. There is no perfect solution and we're gonna keep trying to do the best we possibly can and make the next right decision for um, our teachers and our students and our staff um, and their families. Uh, I wanted to say tonight, I'm super excited to help some lovely members of True 1346 earn their citizenship in the community badge. They've been watching our school board meeting. I hope we've done them proud and uh, I look forward to getting to be a part of that. And I hope everybody has a wonderful, restful weekend. 
uh, and we all come back to this with a renewed sense of uh, getting it right for, for all of us. Take care. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Ms. Dernak, Kofax. Thank you. Um, echoing the words of my colleagues, um, this is, we are in difficult times and we are in difficult times because we are not only talking, we, we're not, we, we know that lives are at stake with any, any decision that we make and we're not taking this lightly. We want to in, in secure, in, ensure your safety and your security. And we are also hearing from parents who um, want to come back because they feel that that's what would, would, would be best for their children. So we are, as a, as a collective body of 12, working with our staff, listening to each and every one of you, and um, we must be responsive to our multiple constituencies. And this is difficult, and I know I'm hearing from a lot of you, it is difficult, you understand that, so thank you. Keep your questions coming, we will keep answering them. We are looking, um, we are gathering them, we are, uh, we are presenting them to staff and they are working on answers for us so we hear you we are listening um, and we care about you and I, I know this is difficult I no longer have children both of my kids have graduated from FCPS but I am facing a similar situation with my daughter and what will I do go going back to college and she goes to school in New York City so it is a very difficult choice we as families are making um, on in in sending our kids off to college or different cities or should we send them back to fcps so we will work we will continue to listen and work with you and make the best decisions that we possibly can that are safe and secure for all of our teachers and our families and i um miss cohen reminded me i spoke yesterday to troop 995 um based out of saint bernadette's and um they have kids from Wayne and Hayfield and St. Bernadette's and um, they talked to me. They are working on their Eagle Scout projects and um, they spoke to um, me extensively about the renaming of Lee High School. And so I enjoyed my afternoon time with them. So thank you all for reaching out to me. And um, we, um, I was so impressed with all of your questions. So um, good luck. And as my colleague said, um, let's, um, let's just continue to work on this issue together because we, we all want to make what's best for each and every one of you happen. Thank you, Ms. Darren Kofax. Mr. Frisch. Thank you, Chairman Corbett Sanders. Um, so many communications from teachers and families, uh, so many questions. Um, that is why we have all been pressing for specificity and detailed plans uh, for the implementation um, uh, and that these issues will be taken into consideration with all potential conting the contingencies. Um, and there will be continue to be questions. I think it's only natural. My partner, Evan, has been an educator in FCPS for 15 years. Um, and we have questions too. Um, I think that's natural during these difficult times as, as FCPS is taking unprecedented steps this fall. Uh, we're all in this together and we're going to have to continue to press for the answers that we need to make decisions for our families. Um, as we continue to move forward, I hope Providence District families will continue contacting me by email, by phone, on social media. Um, I've received about 300 emails in the last week. Um, and during the closure, I've scheduled a little over 100 hours for town halls and phone calls and Zoom video conferences with parents, students, and staff. So if you'd like to have one of these one-on-one -on -one meetings, it's so difficult to be with people, you know, we're, because of social distancing, we're not seeing each other. But if you'd like to have a Zoom video conference or a phone call with me and talk about your concerns or your comments, um, you can find links for that on my official social media channels, Carl Frisch, FCPS on Twitter and Facebook, and we can set something up. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Ms. Keys Gamara. Coming. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. I want to start off by thanking uh, 
uh, my panelists for my student uh, town hall last night. Uh, Kimberly Botang was there with me, I mentioned already. Uh, she did a fabulous job, but we had rep representatives from Hayfield High School, TJ Langley, Oakton, Chantilly, and Justice. And they were, they represented FCPS uh, in such an excellent fashion that I just, um, I was so very proud. And so I, I just want to say thank you, Kimberly, Kelly, Alina, Layla, Liam, Elena, and Lily. Um, so thank you so much. We will uh, work to continue the discussions. Um, our kids are very concerned about kids, I'm sorry, our students and young adults are uh, very concerned about what's going on in the world from everything from what the pandemic has done to our schools, how that has produced inequities in access to education, to uh, very frank conversations about experiences and whether we stood up to racism or not. And I just was so very proud and I pray that we can continue those discussions. Um, I also was able to meet with the principals in the Madison Pyramid uh, right after our distance learning discussion. And I was uh, bombarded with questions about specificity for our distance learning and how that is impacting them. So I look forward to working with my colleagues because I know we are all pushing together to make sure that our staff as though they have the tools successful. So I want to understand the board is concerned about that as well. And I know that from talking to my colleagues. So I just I'm just grateful for this opportunity. We'll be planning another town hall. Um, and I look forward to um, having these additional meetings to make sure that the community feels comfortable as we go forward uh, into the next school year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keys Gamara. Ms. McLaughlin. Yes, um, can you hear me, Ms. Corbett? We can hear you. Wonderful. Um, I, I would like to um, share with the public uh, that we, we spoke about a number of important issues this evening, um, but I, I wanna capture up where we are in return to school from my own personal perspective. Um, there just simply wasn't enough time during the Monday work session. So to all the families and employees who've reached out to me, I want you to know this. I do believe that the school system needs to allow families to choose semester by semester, not year, a, a year long choice um, without the ability to change that. I do believe that we need to look at extending the um, commitment deadlines for our employees and for our families um, as the board reviews with the superintendent an opportunity to delay um, the start of the school year so that FCPS has uh, got all of the proper plans um, and executions in place. Um, I do believe that FCPS needs to do a far better job along with our board of communicating on the data and the science both nationally and internationally. The ability to safely reopen our schools for in-person learning and this is not something FCPS is doing in a vacuum. It's happening all across the country. It was happening all across the world. Our colleges are doing the same. I'm a college, uh, a parent of a college student and the college is facing this. FCPS can and must join all other public education settings in doing this well and doing it effectively. And I want to reassure uh, all of the people who've reached out to me and who are listening that I believe this board is exceptionally dedicated to us getting there. Uh, but I, I do worry about the intentionality of how words. While we will be extremely sensitive to the health conditions of our employees, our families, their loved ones, we also need to be mindful that as the entire society in Fairfax County is reopening through phases in a safe manner as governed by the CDC and our governor of Virginia and our Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, this school system is not exempt from that. We are a vital service 
and I look forward to partnering with our Board of Supervisors and our uh, state leaders in ensuring a safe reopening of schools, but an effective reopening of schools. And finally, I wanted to say to all parents in, in particular concerned, I do want you to know that I believe our children need instruction every single day. I believe that our teachers do not need to be wearing multiple hats and having a workload that is overwhelming to them. And I do believe that this school board needs to engage in additional work sessions with the superintendent to help uh, improve upon the plans that have been laid out so far. But I very much understand why so many employees and families are feeling very anxious right now. And it's our job to address that anxiety successfully. And I want to reassure the public that we are spending 24 seven as a board trying to su support the best efforts possible of SCPS. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Ms. Marin. Thank you. So I too am receiving many constituent emails from parents and from teachers, both teachers that live in Hunter Mill or teachers that teach in Hunter Mill. And I hear you. I know that there is much more information needed to make decisions and plans. You know, it was important for the school board to provide consensus for the overall plan so that the superintendent could set in motion all of the communication and operational work that needs to be done by the time school opens. But however, I too am eager to learn of the details and the information. To staff, I am asking our superintendent and human resources department about addressing your many questions. And for parents, I'm in your boat trying to manage the days and these decisions um, about my own children who are in elementary school. And I know for some of you, it's a very clear decision of whether or not to send your child to school or keep them home or as a staff return to school or stay home. But I know um, whether or not that's where you're at, I realize that everyone wants more information before making decisions. So as soon as I receive answers, the questions, I will share them, all the ways that I do already on my, my Facebook page, SPS Hunter Mill, on Twitter, on my News You Choose email, and in responding to your emails. So um, I communicated with high school coaching staff to hear from parents of athletes about what they're seeking. And I do believe the information will be coming from the Virginia High School League, the HSL. Um, they're the ones that are going to you know, um, have the information that's going to decide how we in Fairfax do things. And similarly, I'm hearing questions about, you know, what about performing arts with the chorus, the band, the orchestra, and that's also something I'm very eager to understand about to keep our students, you know, active in their arts. Um, I also am concerned about our role in taking on all of this as FCPS, and I do believe that our county health department has a much bigger role to play here, particularly when it comes to screening our students and staff. Um, if we're talking about daily screening, I, you know, this county it's going to be a joint effort. So I'm very eager to do that work with our board of supervisors and the county health department. And, you know, just if I can ask, you know, please know that there will be some unknowns that remain, no matter how much information we can provide. And so as much as we can prepare ourselves to not have all the answers, it's going to be that much better for us all. So uh, when I look at everything else we did this week, uh, it's no wonder that I'm pretty tired, but uh, wow, what amazing things to be tired doing. We uh, went forward with renaming Lee High School and through that process, after listening to all of the heartache and pain that um, advocates were putting forth, it really uh, makes me want to improve and expedite how we rename our schools. Um, we shouldn't have to drudge up all of that. Um, we know that these names are egregious, so I am hoping to help with that in the future. Um, I was at a Juneteenth celebration and a rally last week here in Vienna at the Vienna First Baptist Church of Vienna. And it was an amazing ceremony with lots of local folks and even Senator Warner came. So um, just, you know, that was less than a week ago already. And um, we've had a very full week here. I feel like uh, we've heard a lot from us this week and I'm aware that lots of people are watching now and that's great. So thank you for being engaged and I'll continue to try to communicate best as I can. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayor and Ms. Omesh. Thank you. Um, Firstly, um, thank you to my colleagues for their comments. I share a number of the concerns that were mentioned. Um, but uh, in, in, in lighter news, I am excited to celebrate our seniors next week. I know we're going to be watching you guys uh, and all the wonderful videos that were made. Um, so I look forward to several days of that. Um, I share, uh, like I said, some of the concerns of my colleagues. I, I want to just frame, you know, for the sake of transparency, 
Um, we are looking at uh, an opportunity where our staff are really working hard to try to provide options for everyone. Uh, and I know um, there's an intention to really be responsive to the needs that were shared through the survey. Um, you know, we are uh, constrained in some ways by some of the requirements coming from the state. Uh, and of course, we have to rely on the health department for a lot of the information that's coming to make sure that we are making factual evidence-based decisions that are also localized because we know we have hot spots across this county where uh, families, I mean, we've heard the stories of, of kids whose parents have passed away as a result of this. And it's very real uh, in, in many of our school communities. Um, mindful, of course, at the same time that a lot of the data isn't there. And so we have to really have a rigorous risk, anal uh, risk analysis and making sure we understand what's coming forward. Um, I, you know, there have been the many questions about what we're going to wear, wh whether teachers, you know, have are going to have options. How are we going to cover the classes that are very niche and specialized? Um, and on and on. I mean, they have lists of questions. I, I want the community to know that in talking to some of our principals and talking to some of our school leadership, they are working very hard um, to make sure that this is going to be successful. I know that we have exceptional leaders who we're going to lead on for this to be successful. Um, but I will continue to ask my questions, as I know my colleagues uh, will as well, to make sure that the implementation piece here um, goes as smoothly as possible. Um, I, and, and in respect to, of course, the, the, the opinions of my colleagues and the division, um, but open to answering any questions folks have. You know how to find me today um, at 7. We are going to be live from Facebook talking about equity with a number of our FCPS staff. Um, Ms. Leona, who's from the, the, uh, who's the director of our Family Engagement Equity Office, as well as Armando Perry, who's our ombudsman. So you can find a little bit more about how you can uh, voice your concerns um, or understand how family engagement is going to look like moving ahead. Um, and, you know, you're uh, able to find me on social media and all of that. I'm not the best at responding to email all the time, but I do read them. Um, and I'm happy to text and, and message with you. Um, when I'm able to, to get to that. So I, I hope you'll tune in tonight. You can ask your questions live and I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, Ms. Omesh. Ms. Pekarski. Thank you. Like everybody else, I too have been inundated with emails. Um, and I, I, I understand the frustration. I understand the, you know, the uncertainties. And like Ms. Marin said, I, I understand having to make this decision with, with very few details uh, as a parent myself, many of us on this board are indeed parents. Uh, I, I would just like to say that while we are dealing with something unlike anything any of us have ever dealt, the end goal is still the same, ensure that we're providing high quality instruction for our children um, despite the obstacles. And while it's difficult to write to many of you that we don't have answers right now, um, we are here and will continue to ensure that we are to, um, sending those questions, having the work sessions, and ensuring that those answers come and come earlier than later so that you can make this decision as to what is best for your kids next year. So thank you. Keep them coming. I will do my best to, to reply uh, with whatever information it is I know right now. Thank you, Ms. Pekarski. Ms. Sizemore-Heiser. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I, similar to many of my colleagues, share the same sentiments many of my colleagues have shared. I, too, have been getting inundated with emails and messages on social media. And I very much appreciate the desire and, and the real need to know all of the details. I, as a parent myself, I want to know all the details so I know what to do with my own son and what I feel is best for him. And, and the reality is that the COVID is the type of disease and what's happening right now is that all the details may never be known or they may change. And, and we as a society have to figure out how to live with that uncertainty. And that's really hard. And I understand that. Having said that, um, please do know that I am reading all of your emails. I'm compiling all of your questions. I'm sending them to leadership to hope that they, as they build their plans out, they'll take those into account. I do know that leadership is working hard to try to figure out all the logistics and details. They will not necessarily all be available immediately, and, and I want them, trust me. But the reality is that what's going on here is that we have to balance safety, education, and the thing our community asks for the most, which is choice. And those three things are hard to balance. 
and it's safety from COVID, it's safety from child abuse, from depression, it's education that's best for our students, that's flexible, um, that includes access and support, and it's choice for those who need to be home and choice for those who want their kids in school and everything in between in an era that might change. So I'm, I'm saying here, completely understand your questions. We are looking for answers and trying to get them to you. But I have asked the community to know that we, a lot of us are parents, a lot of us have um, partners who are teachers, a lot of us who had kids in our school, and, and we know that this is really, really hard. But what's going on here is we are reimagining education in a way that we haven't had to do before. And that's hard and is a big logistical challenge. So the answers are coming, the, the details are coming. Please keep your questions coming so our staff know what our parents and, and staff are concerned about. I promise you I'm reading all the emails. We're getting to them as quickly as we can. I um, am holding a town hall with Dr. Anderson Monday night from 7 to 8. So hop on on whatever answers we have. We'll give them to you and whatever concerns you have, we'll take them back. But I just wanted to end with, with something here. I wanted to say that, look, what's going on right now is we are trying to make lemonade out of some of the worst lemons I have ever seen in my life. Right, and I anticipate that whatever lemonade we end up making will be sour to some, probably not sweet to anyone, but hopefully palatable to enough people. And that's the reality of COVID. So thank you for your patience. Thank you for reaching out that keep them coming. And thank you for um, caring so much about our schools and our kids and our teachers. And please know that we care just as much and are working incredibly hard to do the best we can by everybody. So thank you all. Ms. Tolan. Thank you. I'm definitely looking forward to our continued work on return to school efforts um, to bring our students a robust and an excellent, an excellent um, educational experience this upcoming school year, um, because that's what we expect from um, Fairfax County Public Schools. Um, yes, the questions are pouring in um, since we announced, um, you know, our idea for a plan for fall. Um, earlier this week. Please keep all those questions coming. Um, many of my colleagues have already expressed eloquently, um, you know, how difficult the situation is, um, you know, for people making decisions, for our families, for our teachers. And I've been hearing from many, many staff members and parents as well. Um, please keep the questions coming. Um, send them. We have an email return to school at fcps.edu. Um, what I might recommend is send them there, but please, you know, particularly if you're in Drainsville, um, it's CC me. So I, I also see what your um, concerns are and can direct specific ones to staff members that are dealing with those particular issues. And um, so I, you know, have a clear understanding also of what everyone is dealing with. Um, I'm reading all of these emails and you know, there are so many questions. We're doing our best to get through those answers. Our first, um, as was mentioned earlier, our first group of uh, frequently asked questions will be put on the website, I believe, tomorrow. And we'll be continuing to do that um, to try to get you answers and um, continue discussions. As some of my colleagues have already mentioned, I would definitely um, encourage additional you know, open discussions around some of these questions and working out some of these issues and just to help everyone make their, you know, important decisions as to what they need to do for their uh, families. Um, a couple of other items, our joint environmental task force will meet virtually next week on July 1st. And we're aiming um, for early fall for a report around some of our goals and um, things that we would like to move forward. We would like to make a report in early fall to you know, both the Board of Supervisors and the school board. Um, Ms. Barron mentioned at the last meeting, she's been working with a great organization, Rustin On, and they also have a Herndon On um, arm. And I'm very happy to be working with that organization, uh, looking at community supports for our Herndon families around COVID and education in general. Um, I was also interviewed by a uh, Boy Scout from Troop 128. Their scouts are very busy working on their citizenship um, and community badges. And we had a fantastic um, conversation around uh, unity and big questions across FCPS. I was very impressed. 
Um, tonight, we talked about um, our advisory committees um, in our consent agenda, and I, I wanted to throw out a thank you to all those uh, drain cell people that are engaged with our committees. And, and let uh, people know that we do need some additional drain cell representation on our, the Human Resources Committee, the Minority Student Achievement Oversight Committee, and the Career and Technical Education Committee. So if you know of people that have background in those areas and may be interested, please have them contact me. Thank you very much and um, have a nice weekend. And again, congratulations, class of 2020. I'm looking forward to the videos next week. Thank you, Ms. Polin. So before I adjourn the meeting, I do want to speak briefly to the return to school plan. And it really is a return to school framework, which the plan is, the more detailed plan is forthcoming. We have had that assurance from the superintendent that um, in July, we will have uh, the full, fully detailed plan. However, there is one area that um, I want to address briefly, and that is the area of how we will best meet the needs of our students with disabilities. And just assure that community that um, the superintendent is committed to providing more details on how we are going to address your concerns and in a manner which will give you time to make the very difficult decisions that all of our families and staff are having to make. Uh, before July 10th. And please understand that we need to hear from you. We need to hear your best thinking about um, critical issues that we are fleshing out. And we also need to uh, assure you that we are listening and we're listening, um, which is why there is a full virtual um, option for all of our families. And as well, we are looking for more details to hear about uh, what is gonna happen on those off days when our children are going to be learning asynchronously versus the days that they will be in school. We also are expecting more details on how our students may be able to participate in um, school-based activities if they go for a full virtual option. And we also understand that our teachers and staff need more clarity as they make these difficult uh, decisions. These are difficult decisions. None of them are easy. And please realize that we are here with you and listening to you in trying to address the concerns of our staff, our families, our students, to ensure that you have a safe and, in, and inclusive, warm, welcoming education environment for next year. And with that, I'm going to adjourn this meeting. Have a great evening, everybody. Bye, good night, everyone. Good night, all.